Hello, AP Bio. I'm just going to pick up where we left off. In population ecology, we're looking at the interaction of individuals with their particular environment. Now, uh, we're here in our notes. Looking at um, how individuals interact with their environment, um, if we look at environments, we can, we can think of uh, different environments across the entire uh, planet we can look at them as sort of collections of selectors. By selectors, I mean environmental factors that are gonna select for and against particular traits. And when we look at population ecology, we can look at those different areas with those particular selective pressures. And we can see a lot of similarities in organisms between them. And actually, sometimes we see the same species, the same species that are fragmented into those particular environments that we can classify those environments uh, by their climactic feature, features and their predominant vegetation. And we the, the term that we use to refer to those quote unquote collections of selectors are biomes. So it just refers to these distinct biological communities and they have a shared physical climate and also vegetation. You should include that in your definition there. Now, different biomes are gonna have different energy budgets. That's the input in and output of energy to and from a biological system. Inputs are things like solar energy, and that inputs primary and secondary productivity. It's uh, also the ability of microorganisms and uh, large organisms as well to decompose, uh, take apart. So that's uh, releasing matter and releasing energy back into a biological system. And then also um, one of the main um, carbon cycling processes is cellular res respiration. So that's going to release um, carbon from organic molecules in the presence of oxygen. In any case, um, energy budgets are different for different biomes. Um, the more energy in is going to be able to support more living organisms. Uh, and energy in comes from solar energy. So in any, in any case, um, if we were to connect that to place where we are in Vermont, we have both aquatic and terrestrial biomes. We have, um, the lake, Lake Champlain. We also have abundant wetlands and then we have streams and rivers. Now, if you think about them, these, all of these habitats have different selective pressures. And if you look in those environments, you would see similar species, um, if not the same species in these different, uh, biomes. And we would see these similar biomes across uh, the entire planet. Sometimes they have the same species. Sometimes they have uh, different species, but with similar uh, adaptations because the selective pressures are similar. We also have two different um, terrestrial biomes. We have terrestrial uh, temperate, pardon me, broadly forest. Temperate means we have seasons. Uh, terrestrial means it's their land uh, biomes. And then we also have alpine tundra because we have uh, the altitude of some of the higher uh, green mountains. In any case, um, so those are, uh, that's one way of classifying an environment that a population lives in. Now populations, again, thinking about what we're talking about, we're talking about population ecology. Populations can be modeled or measured using, uh, and described, I should say described, using different, um, characteristics. And um, the characteristics are things uh, like uh, population demographics. Those are um, describe it, characteristics that describe populations. And population ecology is exploring the change in populations over time. So we can look at growth curves. We can also use math uh, to describe uh, populations and to model populations. So let's go here in your notes and let's think about uh, let's talk a little bit about how we might measure populations. So you can measure populations by, oops, simply uh, counting the number of organisms of a particular species. Uh, you can use random sampling to estimate numbers. Um, you can also uh, use a mark and recapture method. Uh, we're going to talk a, a little bit about this. Just leave that blank for a second. In any case, uh, mark and recapture just means that you capture a bunch of organisms from the environment, 
you mark them. I counted you, maybe banding of a bird, maybe putting a radio transmitter in a shark, etc. And then you release them back into the environment. And then after a certain period of time of reassimilating, you recapture them and recount. And we'll talk about how you can use that to measure population numbers. But all of these things measure, uh, allow scientists to measure the numbers of uh, organisms in a particular a sample. We use capital N to designate how many organisms are in a population. Um, in any case, we also have uh, using number and then using uh, population numbers, total numbers, and then using other characteristics of an environment, we can get to these other properties of populations. For example, we can get population density, and you know what density means. It's just the uh, number of individuals or num number of things per unit area and in this particular case we're looking at population density so it's the number of individuals or particular species or a particular population in a given area density is increased by births also organ uh, organisms of the same species uh, coming into the population um, and then decreases are a result of either deaths or organisms leaving a population. Remember, populations are species groups, so you can, one organism could go from one population to the next. Um, there are factors uh, that affect growth of populations um, that um, have to do, that are impacted by density. So there's a change in the mortality, what that means is there's a change in mortality, meaning how many organisms die of a particular species or how many are uh, are born um, that are affected by density. And that's going to impact, uh, density dependent factors are uh, going to impact what we call carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is, we use the, the, ver the symbol K, uh, to designate carrying capacity, and it just refers to the maximum number of individuals a given area can support. So carrying capacity, you can think of it as uh, a particular habitat. That's the available resources that can per that can support a particular organism. And as organisms reach, uh, move, increase toward their carrying capacity, um, density dependent factors are going to level out the population. I'll talk more about it in a minute. And then there's also density independent factors that have nothing to do with how dense a population is. These are things that are going to reduce population size regardless of the value of K. And they can be uh, natural uh, environmental factors or human, things like the climate, um, things like flood or fire, pollutants in the environment. But if you think about it, density dependent factors are things like potentially disease. So some diseases are more prevalent um, um, that uh, as it, it, there's an increase in density in numbers of species or as there is a decrease in, in density, things like uh, food availability is going to be a density dependent factor that's going to impact uh, density of a population. The important thing looking at density dependent and density independent factors is the idea of limiting factors. So limiting factors are going to limit the number of organisms or the size of a population in a given area. We can see that, I'll talk about human population in a minute, but we can see how it doesn't, it, it's a, it's logical to think about why as a population continues to increase, there's gonna be greater competition for resources. And like I said, the um, density dependent factors, they can impact um, density, but they can also impact a second measure of, or a way of describing a characteristic of properties, how you could describe a property, and that is what's called dispersion. So dispersion has to do with the pattern of spacing of individuals, and the spacing can be described in three basic ways. Sometimes populations are clumped, in little, little clumps so that there'll be a group, a species group here, a species group here, a species group here in a given area. Sometimes it's totally random and sometimes it's uniform. There's even spacing. So the, so uh, organisms that are clumped, uh, clustered due to resource distribution, uh, usually is due to resource distribution. So for example, 
in a desert, you would see clumped uh, organisms uh, around a water source, for example. Um, so like elephants on um, a large dry area would be clumped around water or and then also clumped around water would be uh, vegetation. And so you would it has to do with patchy distribution of resources. If if it's totally random um, and unpredictable, it's often due to low interaction between the members of a population, something like dandelions uh, they're growing randomly in a uh, open area they need sun but when they're, they're growing they, they don't really impact each other and they're not impacted much by um, available resources and then there's also uniform spacing this is when the resources are scarce so in this particular case they're showing penguins so penguins are living in an area where resources are are uh, scarce and organisms occupy a given area because that's where uh, the resources are and it, and the, the particular environment can't support uh, more organisms. You'll see uniform spacing, spacing of deciduous trees and forests and actually trees in general because a large tree will take up a certain amount of resources and there's actually mathematical equations that you that uh, foresters and, and um, plants botanists can use to try to, to to predict the spacing of trees in a particular forest. A third way, a third characteristic or property to describe population is a collection of details that we call demographics. And demographics just refer to vital statistics. And there are things like, vital statistics are things oops, uh, like how many to total are in the population. And we talked a little bit a second ago about how you might measure a total. Um, and we use the, the capital letter N to, to describe uh, total numbers of a population. Also something uh, that's called age structure. And age structure just refers to, in a population, the number of individuals of each age. So a population is, uh, maybe really old or really young, and you can get these curves that show uh, how old organisms are in a particular population, uh, survivorship curves and things like that. Um, uh, anyway, and then uh, another uh, demographic is fecundity, and fecundity just means uh, reproductive rate, so the number of offspring an individual can produce. For example, humans have a relatively low fecundity. We don't produce that many babies, but like frogs produce a lot of freaking babies, and so that they would have a high fecundity. Now, fecundity goes hand in hand with mortality. Uh, some organisms don't have that many babies, but they have a low mortality rate, birth mortality rate, unlike uh, frogs have high uh, mortality rate. So uh, mortality is just a measure of deaths. And then sex ratio is another important um, uh, demographic, and that's just the male-female ratio. Now, we're going to uh, visit the green sheet in class and talk about uh, equations that allow us to use these statistics here uh, to predict growth in populations over time. Okay, that's it for now. Uh, for um, um, information that we can use to describe uh, populations, in the next video I'm going to talk about uh, the specific characteristics of uh, organisms that impact uh, the way the population grows over time. Okay, hope that was helpful.